Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must obey them and do everything they, they tell you, but do not, do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for men to see. They make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogue. They love to be greeted in the marketplace and to have men call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have only one master, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to, call, to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you will be your servant, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Maybe you've seen uh, those billboards on the highway that uh, tell you, you know, we buy ugly houses. Uh, and uh, sadly, in our day, uh, there are a lot of people who buy ugly religion and think they've gotten a really good deal uh, on it, okay? Um, and when we come to Matthew 23, Jesus is telling Israel... He's telling these same Jewish leaders who had just questioned him, trying to trip him up in Matthew 22, and then Jesus asks them uh, the questions at the end of 22, and now he confronts them. And maybe this is kind of the, the major head-on confrontation that Jesus has with these religious leaders. And, uh, and, and so in this 23rd chapter of Matthew, you have what are called the, the seven woes, and uh, and Jesus is confronting them for their ugly religion. He says, you've taken something that God has given you and you've turned it in uh, to something uh, ugly. Now, you might be uh, asking, well, how could uh, any religion be ugly? You know, uh, all religions are equal, aren't they? Um, um, don't they all just worship the same God but by a different name? I don't know how many times you've heard that, but probably several, okay? Okay. Walk in any religious door, and shouldn't we get the same basic product? The truth of the matter is no. All religions are not beautiful, and some are downright ugly, okay? Jesus points out that the Judaism of his day that, was, that God intended to be beautiful had been so distorted that it had now become ugly religion. It was distorted from what God intended it to be. The religious leaders were uh, great at giving rules and adding burdens that more often than not crushed the people under their weight. And people would come to the religious leaders and, and uh, ask a question and they'd say, well, let me just give you one more thing to do or two more things to do or three more things to do. And if you do this, then you will be a really good person. And so the, the weight grew bigger and bigger and bigger upon these people. And, and these religious leaders claimed to sit in the seat of Moses speaking with, with his authority. But through their oral traditions that they had added to the scriptures, their religion had, had become a burden. The scripture has, had become so mixed with tradition that they became distorted beyond recognition. And you'd say, well, is this really biblical teaching? And in many cases, in fact, most, there wasn't. Now, we can do that today. You know, I've seen some churches that, uh, that will tell you that, you know, to really be the proper Christian, uh, uh, men, your hair needs to not touch your ears because God does not like hair touching your ears. Now, some of you today might, well, you might offend God in that, but some of you are really safe, okay? Mark, uh, you don't have to worry about that at all, okay? And, uh, and, and so, so 
we, we get these rules that we try to pile on to, to the beauty of God's grace. You know, we, we may say uh, in a particular church, you know, if the women really want to be spiritual, they can only wear denim skirts, you know, and, 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 and denim is, is the most holy material that you can wear. And it's like, no, you can wear denim or you can not wear denim, and God doesn't really care, okay? But we've added these things to Scripture. Well, that's what had happened in, in Israel. They had added uh, rule upon rule. Now, we look at our, at our own nation, and we might say of, of our own nation that we have become so overburdened with a multitude of laws and interpretations that the laws applied unequally or not at all. And in many cases, it's impossible to avoid being a lawbreaker. You know, uh, last year, soon I went out to, uh, to D.C., and we sat in on one session of the Senate, you know, where it's kind of empty, and the guys just get up to kind of hear their voice echo around the chambers. And, uh, uh, and, and, and the senator from Utah, uh, Orrin Hatch, got up, and, and he was talking about, um, to, to a chamber filled with no one, um, but um, he was saying, we got too many laws. He says, we got laws on the books from who knows when, and he says, they'll never be recognized. Uh, they conflict with each other. And, and his point in his little speech was, we got too many laws. Well, Israel had too many laws. And, uh, and, and in our day, it's been said that, that due to the complexity of our laws, any person on the street could probably be convicted for something. So any of you here today, you know, we could probably find something to, you know, uh, charge you with. And Jewish religion had become so complex that no one could even know the law. You had to have experts in the law, uh, and, and, and therefore it was impossible to live up to its requirements. So Jesus tells the crowds to listen to what is scriptural and toss out the rest. Now, uh, in, in verses 3 and 4, uh, he says, uh, So you must obey them, those who sit in the seat of Moses. And I think he's saying, Obey them as far as it is scriptural. And do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. And interestingly, he says this in the presence of the religious leaders who had just attempted to trap him with their questions in, in chapter 22. And, and actually, 22 goes right into chapter 23. So just after Jesus begins to, to ask his questions of them, then he moves in to this denunciation of, of, of the way Judaism was practiced in that particular culture. Jesus then is denouncing ugly religion, um, and he reveals their inward pomp and their pride that was designed only to draw attention to their own importance, and, uh, and, and he says, your pomp and your pride and your pageantry um, he says, are, are just ugly to God. In verses 5 through 7, he says, everything they do is done for men to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the places of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogue. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces and to have men call them rabbi. And, and you know, the, the, the phylacteries were, were kind of little scripture boxes that, that they would carry about four passages from the Old Testament and, and they would uh, put it on their forehead or they would uh, tie it on their wrist uh, uh, or forearm, and, and, and in order to prove that you were more spiritual than any of those other rabbis or Pharisees, it says, you made your scripture box bigger than anybody else's, you know? And if you had a big scripture box, man, that guy is really spiritual. I mean, look at him. And, and Jesus is saying, this is all show, people. And it's ugly what you're doing. Jesus was confronting them head on. 
And in the meantime, the cross was looming. And he was fearless in his denunciation of this ugly religion. He calls attention to their love for impressive titles, and he draws a distinction between such arrogance and the humility that was to be evident among the people of the kingdom. In verse 8, he says, but you, and here he's talking to believers, but you, in contrast to all of this, are not to be called rabbi, for you have only one master, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you will be your servant. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And Jesus says one of the defining characteristics of the citizens of the kingdom will be their humility. Now that means in the church there's not a lot of room for us to, to, to get to arrogant, okay? That's one of those sins that God doesn't smile on. And, and, and oftentimes we excuse it. We say, well, that, that's not that bad a sin. Yeah, it's horrible. Because it's what is supposed to, uh, to, to define us as, as believers. So if your religion is wrapped up in a multitude of, of rules that you demand of yourself and everyone around you, uh, your religion is just as ugly as the religion that Jesus was confronting here. You know, if you are more concerned about looking good in the eyes of other people and being important, your religion is just as ugly as what was going on here in Matthew 23. If your traditions have replaced clear biblical teaching, then you have only created confusion and undermined the authority of God's Word, placing the authority of your traditions above that of Scripture. And that's ugly religion. If your religion has produced a spiritual arrogance that you believe sets you above other Christians or people in general, then you probably have a bad case of ugly religion. But here is the truth we see in this passage. Ugly religion always produces ugly results. And at this point in Matthew's gospel, we see Jesus passing judgment upon the ugly religion of his own people. Throughout this book, we have seen uh, Jesus repeatedly warning Israel, inviting her to come to repentance. But Israel has resisted over and over again. In Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, you know, hey, what's going to happen if we ignore so great a salvation? Well, that's exactly what they were doing. They were ignoring so great a salvation that had, had come to them. Jesus uh, has even told the leaders of Israel that the offer of the, of the kingdom that they had rejected, he said earlier in Matthew 21, that uh, that, that kingdom would be offered to another people. Um, there it is up there. We don't have it up here. But uh, it says, Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, the religious leaders in Israel, and given to a people who will produce its fruit. And, uh, and, and, and so Jesus said, You're not going to be in power forever, so don't get too comfortable, okay? Uh, Jesus had also presented the evidence that he was the Messiah and the Son of God finally confronting them with, with a basic question. And, and at the end of chapter 22, he says, what do you think about the Christ? And that's what would appear up there, okay? Uh, but, uh, but as is so often the case, the evidence makes little difference when you have already decided not to believe. And these religious leaders knew that they had no intention of, of believing. Now, because of their rejection, Jesus is saying, I'm now your judge. You see a shift here in Matthew 23. He has offered salvation. He has offered salvation. He has offered salvation. He's called them to repentance. He's given evidence of who he is. He's, he's reasoned with them in chapter 22. He's answered their questions. But now it's come to the point of, of judgment. And he says, it's done. You have 
have come to the, to the point of, of judgment. Now, we don't often like to think of Jesus as judge, but the fact is that when we reject him as Savior, there's no other option available to us. One day we will all stand before Jesus, either as our Savior who has paid the penalty for our sins or the judge who will bring down judgment upon our heads as the due penalty for our sins. The question is simply whether he will pay for our sins or we will pay for them. The love and justice of God will have it no other way. In his love, he said, I'll, I'll pay for their sins. But in his justice, he says, but the sin must be paid for. It has to be paid for. We can't just leave it out there forever and ever. You see, there would not be a perfect and holy justice in the, in the world if God simply ignored that. So he says, Jesus has to be one or the other. He has to be savior or judge. Even as Jesus declares judgment upon Israel, he uses a word that uh, is mentioned here, woe unto you. And uh, it's a word that, that indicates judgment but it's also a word that indicates judgment mixed with sorrow. And so when we, when we look at, at, at this passage, you know, we think Jesus is just hammering them, and he is. But there's also a sense of, of sorrow in this word that, that he uses. Um, the, uh, he says to them, they are hypocrites who speak of the kingdom of God but oppose the king who has come to them. They even oppose those who would accept Jesus as their king. They pretend at righteousness without the reality. In verse 13, Jesus says, Woe to you in, in, in the first woe. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. And these religious leaders at every turn were opposing Jesus. And they were opposing the disciples. And, 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 and so they were trying to keep people out of the kingdom that God wanted to bring about. So uh, even today, you know, uh, pretenders and hypocrites can be trapped in legalism that isn't real righteousness. And legalism is powerless to produce real righteousness. It's common for men to think that the gospel consists of a list of rules to follow in our own strength rather than a savior who empowers us to live in his strength. The gospel is not rules but a relationship. And the Apostle Paul says any other gospel is false. In Galatians 1.9, he, he, he says, if anyone preaches to you any other gospel than the one I have proclaimed, let them be accursed. And you say, but there are many gospels. No, there can't be. If there's one God and there's one Savior, then there is one gospel. There cannot be many gospels. It is impossible. And so if we begin to distort this gospel, we are sending people to, to judgment because we have distorted the truth of, of the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus recognized that the Pharisees were not proclaiming God's truth, but they were proclaiming their own. He says, for I can testify about them that they are zealous for God. But their zeal, speaking of Israel, is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, in their own power, they did not submit to God's righteousness that was offered to them in Christ. In their zeal, then, they were only creating more self-righteous legalists who merely reflected more of their own ugly religion. Now, uh, uh, in verse 15, Paul says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. He says that repeatedly. You know, you're play actors. You're pretending. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. 
And all they were doing was recreating more legalists because they didn't understand the beauty of the gospel and the sweetness of the grace of God and tried to take the gospel and turn it into a stack of, of rules. They had devised a religion in addition that allowed them to continue in their sin while rationalizing their disobedience. Because if you've got all these rules, well, then you've got to have an escape clause. And they had lots of escape clauses, you know? It's like a lawyer today will say, well, you know, you, got, you better make this tight because, because, you know, you don't want too many loopholes. Well, they had all kinds of loopholes that would excuse them uh, to, to go ahead and, and, and be disobedient. You know, uh, in, in verses 16 through 22, he says, Woe to you, blind guides. So he says, you're guides, but you're blind, okay? Not a very good guide. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. So unless you, you know, make your oath in the right way, you can break it and you can lie. Um, and Jesus says, you're blind guides. You know, you've got this complex method of ignoring simple obedience. You blind fools, he says in verse 17, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men. There's the third time. Blind guides, uh, blind fools, blind men. And he says, which is greater, the gift uh, or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And he who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. And Jesus says elsewhere, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And that, he says, is to reflect the people of God. We're not to look for loopholes. It says, just be honest. Just speak the truth. And, and, and God can create a community of beauty if, if we put that into practice. And it's kind of a simple thing, isn't it? Just tell the truth. These religious leaders had developed a complex system of excuses that relieved them of any responsibility to obey what God had commanded. They set up a long list of rules and then found uh, loopholes and exceptions so that they could avoid following those rules. Their system allowed them to lie without calling it a lie. Well, it's just a, it's, it's just a minor deception. Uh, it's, a, it's a creative uh, view of things. It's just an exaggeration. But you see, we are guilty of that. And we try to excuse ourselves in those ways, instead of letting our yes be yes and our no be no. You know? So their system allowed them to lie without calling it a lie, to cheat without calling it cheating, to steal without calling it stealing, and to be greedy without calling it greed. In Mark 12, 40, Jesus says of these leaders, they devour widows', widows houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. So they weren't ethical. They said, you know, we will steal a widow's house in order for us to make a, a buck. But we'll do it all with a nice religious show about it. You know? And years ago, you know, I, I, I worked with a, a pastor um, during my time in seminary who did just this. He basically took a woman's house and then patted himself on the back that, well, you know, she didn't need it and I did and so she gave it to me. And it happens. And it's ugly religion. And I hate it. I despise it. Jesus calls it just what it is, ugly religion. Ugly religion. 
And a religion that does not produce ethical and moral behavior that flows from the grace of God is just ugly. But Jesus isn't done yet. He goes on to confront them with the reality that they are so focused on the little things that they have forgotten the big things. They have maximized the minimum while minimizing the maximum. They have majored on minors and minored on majors. In verse 23 and 24, Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. There's the word again. He says, it's pretend religion. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You're, you blind guides, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. Now, they had inverted the divine value system. And they have made the insignificant significant. And uh, God had already told them 700 years earlier what was most important to him. God spoke through the prophet Micah, and in Micah 6, 8, God said, He has showed you, O man, what is good, what is most important. And what does the Lord require of you to act justly? That means have integrity in your business dealings, in your dealings with people. You know, speak honestly. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be faithful. So he says, act justly. Love mercy. Be ready to forgive. You know, sometimes we are so ready to judge. And he says, fall in love with mercy. Because judgment doesn't accomplish much. And you know what? I've been guilty of that myself where I've been hesitant to quickly forgive. But it's something that we need to develop in our faith. We learn to walk humbly with our God. That means simple obedience to him. Not trying to find loopholes or ways out or, 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 or rationalizations. Walk humbly with God. And when he says, this is what is best for you, then live that out day by day. Notice that God doesn't seem to emphasize back there in Micah 6, 8, much about dill seeds or mint leaves. He doesn't say, you know, for us to go out in our garden in back of the parsonage over here and, and take 10 mint leaves, you know, and carefully measure them out and say, okay, I'm going to put this mint leaf in the offering plate. And then I take my cinnamon, you know, and, I, and I, I take a tenth of it and I scoot it over and I pour it off into a little cup and I'm going to give that to God. You know, it, he says, what is important then are, are, are these issues. Justice, mercy, and humility before God. He, in fact, he tells them that they strain out a gnat that was considered a, an unclean animal or an insect. And he said, you strain it out. Whenever they would drink wine, the, the Pharisees would filter their wine either through linen in order to make sure that a gnat, an unclean animal, didn't get into their wine before they drank it. The other thing that they would do is, in order to protect themselves from this unclean gnat, oftentimes when the Pharisees would drink their wine, they would drink it through their clenched teeth so that no gnat would get in their mouth, okay? Okay. And Jesus says, you care more about a stupid gnat than you do about the holiness that God has called you to. You have majored on minors. You, you strain at a gnat and you swallow a camel, which was another unclean animal. You know? And he says, he says, you have swallowed the ugly, big issues of faith. The important stuff. Now, They have lost a sense of proportion as to what is most important in our faith. An ugly religion loses a sense of proportion. And in our own lives, a faith that does not prioritize that which is really important becomes an ugly faith. Jesus also makes it clear that what he desires is an internal righteousness that only he can give. The problem of sin, he says, goes deep. And he says, we can't just clean up the outside. 
uh, the inside of our soul then is, is left unattended and filthy. We've failed to deal with the source of the problem, and he says, ugly religion means we've become more concerned with looking good on the outside than actually being good on the inside. He is pointing out their need for a, for a savior. In verses 25 and 26, he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. So he says, the source of your problem is not external behavior, it's the internal sin that indwells you. And that internal sin, indwelling sin, must be dealt with. So he says, blind Pharisees first clean the inside of the cup and dish, then the outside will also be clean. So Jesus is saying, take care of the sin nature that is within us, and then we can begin to deal successfully with the sinful actions that result from indwelling sin. Jesus tells us that the Pharisees are blind to the depth of the sin problem, and he's telling uh, all of us that salvation and redemption must begin on the inside at the source of our problems. External solutions will never work and they never will. And so, so if we say, well, I, I'm going to just, I'm going to reform my life and I'm going to work on this habit and I'm going to work on that habit and I'm going to be a better person and I am not going to be as grumpy this week as I was last week, okay? Uh, and, and that might be a good one for me to think about, okay? But, but, but in all of that, we, we look at the ex external behavior and we don't realize that the problem is, is, is internal. It's sort of like, you know... Uh, your, your car dies on, on the side of the road, you know, and it sputters and, and, uh, and, and you go and look at it and, and, and you say, you know, I think if I just change the radiator cap, that ought to fix it up, you know, but it isn't leaking, you know, and, it, and, and it's maybe the pistons, you know, uh, are, are bad and it's an internal problem, but, but you do an external solution and you think you've taken care of it. And, uh, and, and so the Apostle Paul makes this same distinction between the sinful nature and the acts of the sinful nature. In Galatians 5, he says, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. But notice he says, the acts of the sinful nature. The sinful nature is sin indwelling. But the acts of the sinful nature are the individual sins. And if we don't deal with indwelling sin through our relationship with the Savior, we cannot deal with the external sins, plural. Um, he says the acts of the flesh, the, the, the plural acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. He's got a nice long list. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But he says, those are the acts of the sinful nature. He, he, even Paul is drawing this distinction. It's an internal problem that will not be fixed by just changing a radiator cap, okay? Um, now, Jesus is saying to these Pharisees, you need to produce internal righteousness that will lead to external holy behavior. And, uh, and if, if that is not happening, not only is there there's the ugliness of sin inside, that type of religion only covers up the reality of death. So in verse 27, uh, Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law! And Pharisees, you hypocrites, you are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. Uh, in the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. So Jesus goes beyond saying there's sin indwelling us. He says the sin that is inside us brings death. And if that sin is not dealt with, that sin will bring eternal death. And that's why it is so urgent for us to realize that, that Christ is the only one who can deal with that indwelling sin. 
In New Testament times, there were impressive tombs uh, in Jerusalem that were, were whitewashed just before Passover to look beautiful. And as soon as I go to India, we plan to see the Taj Mahal, which is uh, an impressive building. The architecture is amazing, and, and our daughter says, we, we're going to go up and see that. Uh, it's in a town of Agra and kind of up in the area of New Delhi. And uh, uh, beautiful building. But a man built it for his wife, whose name was Mahal, and uh, she's buried there. So what we're doing is we're going to look at a whitewashed tomb, okay? Uh, an impressive-looking tomb, a monument to death, okay? Uh, but, but in reality, it's just a tomb. And behind the external beauty, there's only death. So just because a religion may look impressive on the outside, it doesn't necessarily produce life. There are a lot of religious people in the world who do not possess eternal life. In fact, Jesus tells us that only in him can we find eternal life. In John 3.36, it says, it says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. And so that decision concerning Christ is the only solution to the problem of death. Jesus is showing them their great need for a Savior. In Romans 6, 23, there the Apostle Paul says, For the wages of sin is death, an eternal separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And uh, finally, Jesus confronts these religious leaders for honoring the memory of the persecuted prophets who told of the coming Messiah while planning to kill the Messiah who came to them. Jesus shines his holy light upon their vile hypocrisy and he tells them that now judgment would fall upon them. They had killed all the prophets that had come to them before and he lists them in, in verses 29 through 32. He says, woe to you. Uh, this is the seventh woe. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our forefathers, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. Well, wait a minute. What were they planning right then? They were planning the death of their Messiah. He says, so you testify against yourselves that you are descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the sin of your forefathers. So he reveals to them that, uh, that they would persecute the also persecute the messengers that Jesus would send to them. And Jesus says, I I'm going to send messengers and you'll persecute them too. And Jesus is speaking of, of, of the apostles. And he says, you're going to persecute them just like you persecuted me, just like you persecuted the prophets in the past throughout the Old Testament. And he says, uh, up till now, God has withheld his ultimate hand of judgment. But he says, now it's too late. He says, the cup of God's wrath is full. And now the cup of wrath will be poured out upon this nation and its peoples. And he says, it will happen within that generation. In verses 33 to 36, he says, you snakes... You brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I am sending you prophets and wise men and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And it's exactly what they did. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. I tell you the truth, all this will come. Uh, upon this generation. So he says the wrath of God is full. And throughout the Old Testament, there's often this picture of the cup of wrath. And the idea is that when the cup of wrath is full, God pours it out and judgment falls. And that's the idea that Jesus is saying here. He said, you know, God overlooked a lot of the things you've done in the past. And, but all of those things, you know, the the persecution of the Old Testament prophets, you kind of kept adding a little more into that bucket, okay? And, uh, and, and then you, you persecuted John the Baptist, and there was a little more put in the bucket, you know? And now you're persecuting the Messiah, and the cup is just about full. And when you persecute the apostles that I'm going to send out, 
the cup is going to be totally full. And it's sort of like when you go to Waterworld, you know they have the big giant bucket that keeps filling and filling and filling, and you stand under it, you know, and you wait until it finally tips, and it just throws this flood of water on you. Well, that's kind of the picture that Jesus is making here. He says the, the, the cup will get so full that finally judgment must fall. And he says it will fall, and he says within that generation of time. Now, uh, uh, that means that bad religion or ugly religion will bring eventual judgment. And God cannot be charged with your judgment because he's, he's warned you of it. He has made allowances for your salvation. And, uh, and within a few years, by 70 AD, the Romans would crush Jerusalem. They would destroy her treasured temple and scatter her people. And some might think, well, you know, Jesus will be really pleased that he's going to destroy Jerusalem and the temple, and he's prophesying that. But instead, we see that, that Jesus takes no pleasure in their judgment. You know, in Isaiah 28 and 21, uh, judgment is called the strange work of God. Because the Bible says God wants to love us. He wants to forgive us. He wants to grant us mercy. But if we won't repent of our sins, he can't do that. That's the one thing God can't do is forgive you of a sin that you will not confess to him. With God, judgment is always the last option after we have ignored every other option and opportunity to repent. In Ezekiel 33, 11, we see God's heart revealed. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Jesus has given them opportunity to repent, but now he mourns all that is about to come upon this city. And he describes it in verses 37 to 39. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets, just as he said, and stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together. Do you hear the tear that, 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 that is in his voice and in his eye? He says, as a hen gathers her chickens uh, chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. You resisted the opportunity of salvation that was presented to you. Look, he says, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we await that day of his coming. And Israel will repent. So look at your own faith. Does your religion turn you into an angry, self-righteous legalist? Does it turn you into an arrogant, super-spiritual mysticist? Or an authoritarian, opinionated know-it-all? If that is what your religion has done to you, then you may not have purchased an ugly house, but you have certainly purchased an ugly religion. If your religion fails to bring redemption from the destructive effects of sin, and if it does not produce the beauty of Jesus in your soul, get rid of your ugly religion and get Jesus. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we thank you for uh, the patience of a congregation that will listen to me cover a big, big chapter. And uh, Lord, I thank you for the privilege of just uh, serving a a beautiful and a wonderful people. And Lord, uh, you call us to day by day to develop the beauty of, of your image and likeness upon our soul and within our church. And Lord, we pray that, that, that we would recognize our need for a Savior. And Lord, we pray for Israel, those people who many of them are still blinded, still seeking their own righteousness instead of the righteousness of, uh, of God. And Lord, we pray for, for Jerusalem and that people. We ask, Lord, that you would open their eyes. And Lord, we pray that you would come once more. And that in that day of your coming, Lord, that, that Israel would say the words that you spoke here in this chapter. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Lord, we look to that day when Israel will bend the knee to you as Lord and Savior. Lord, bless these truths to our hearts and let us not fall into the trap of ugly religion.
but let the beauty of Jesus be evident in all we say and all we do. And we give you the praise in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Father, we thank you that we do need you. We can't accomplish righteousness in our own strength. Righteousness begins on the inside with the Savior who brings life and beauty and cleansing and purity, who brings ethics and morality on the outside, who brings love and grace that we direct to others in, in the midst of community. And Lord, the beauty of jo Jesus that begins to dwell on the inside of us, flows into an ever-flowing righteousness that manifests itself on the outside. Lord, those religious leaders fail to see that truth. But Lord, we pray that as your people, you have entrusted your truth and your salvation to us, and we ask, Lord, that you would make that reality uh, come true in our lives as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.